Hi, everybody. You are listening to the Procure Smarter podcast. I am your host, Dr. Sharon Cook. And today we are talking to Mr. Kyle Allison. He is the media host, um, the owner of the Hospitality MD podcast. He is an award-winning filmmaker. I'm very much looking forward to talking to him. Okay, guys, uh, this podcast, every episode is sponsored by the Procure Smart Purchasing Agency. If you have a renovation, construction, conversion, we would love to talk to you about your ff e needs. Um, reach out to us. All right, guys, everybody stay tuned. Hi, everybody. We are back with Mr. Kyle Allison, as promised. He is the host of Hospitality MD, an award-winning filmmaker. Um, and the currently, correct me if I'm wrong, the manager of the Doubletree by Hilton. Yeah, I'm I'm a manager there. I'm not the GM, but I uh, I manage their uh, off-premise catering department, which well, is a new a new business. So it's kind of fun. Well, cool. Well, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor, and thanks everybody who's listening for tuning in to hear me talk. It means a lot. All right. So normally, the very first question I ask is a little bit about your journey. But I have done some research and I know that your love of hospitality goes way back, right? Like, did you not start a little mini hotel in your childhood home? I did, yep. They were my only guests, was my (laughs) parents. It was a one room hotel that was just them. Um, And they were, they got stay over service every day in their room. Uh, I actually had uh, like, collateral of like that would go on their nightstand and stuff of like in-room dining menus and like in-room entertainment like all the directories collateral that you would see in like a branded uh mid-scale hotel was represented in my parents room um we were full service food and beverage (laughs) from whatever was in the fridge um we didn't get cisco deliveries but we did get grocery shopping so yeah it was a lot of fun that was my first hotel job I guess now it was a long time ago but do you remember what drove that like did you see something on tv and you were like that just looks interesting do you you remember yeah I do remember um I mean it was a collective of things because my mom is a flight attendant she still is but she was back then too and Um, like I remember traveling with her and staying in hotels and just being out with her and like um, just the whole feeling of like travel wake up you get on the plane you get dressed up because you back then you couldn't wear like jeans if you were traveling with an employee on the plane so I would always wear like you know a button down shirt khakis like as a little kid walking around like I had my own little mini suitcase (laughs) and I, and I, I felt like a business traveler, um, like what you would consider to be a modern day business traveler. I felt super important. I'm like, I'm traveling on the plane and because it was a, we flew standby because it was free. So you didn't get to pick where you sat. It was just whatever was open. So I would oftentimes find myself in a middle seat as like a six year old kid with sandwich between two business travelers. Um, so I wasn't with my mom or my dad on the plane. I was by myself with two business travelers. And I was like, I'm just one of these guys just traveling, doing my thing. Um, so that whole experience led me to staying in different hotels. And, um, I remember staying in one hotel that was actually, my house was getting painted or something and, or fumigated or something was happening. And it was only a five minute drive away, I stayed at a hotel. um, And that's what inspired me to do the hotel in my house. And on the collateral that I was mentioning that we had, it actually said the name of this hotel (laughs) that I stayed at. And I I forgot about it, but then flash forward to 11 years later, when I got my first hotel job, it was actually that same hotel that I had stayed at and had the collateral with the name written on it. And my mom sent me a picture of her finding this collateral somewhere in a box somewhere. And it said the name of the hotel, which was Indian Lakes Resort. Um, and that was my first ever hotel job. And I didn't know it until after I'd already been working there. So it was this whole full circle thing of staying there, turning my house into a hotel based on that same hotel, and then finally entering the industry for real and it being that same hotel. 
Isn't that, that was crazy? Out. Now, this love of hospitality really stuck with you throughout your childhood, right? Good, like, good, good. Sorry, guys. I'm on a phone call right now. Sorry. You're good, <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, take it easy. Now, this love of hospitality really stuck with you, right? Like, throughout your... Hold on one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you forgot it? Yeah. It's okay. You can take it home. It's not stealing. <laughs> See you tomorrow, though. Thanks. So this is, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to make this point because it's actually happening is like, this is just some of the great stuff that happens in the hotel industry. Like, I live in the hotel that I work in. Uh -huh. And right now, you know, it's the middle of the day, I'm sitting in a conference room recording it and the breakfast cooks are walking through, they didn't know that I was on a call. So they're coming and we're shaking hands and they're, you know, talking like there's really good people in the industry and when you build relationships with people they they love to see you they love to talk to you and um so that was just an example of that happening in real time so but okay. sorry for the interruption no i worked i worked in hospitality for the last 25 years i totally get it um if they didn't say hi to you then that would be a problem right right big time <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go back to this love of hospitality. So this really stuck with you throughout your a childhood, right? Like you tried college and that was you, you went into hotel work and you realized college wasn't for you. you it, normally when you find a love as a kid, you kind of outgrow it, but you didn't. Yeah. I like, I will admit that there was a time that I like kind of forgot about it. Like, you know, when you reach like adolescence, for example, and you're like, you know, in school and you're doing extracurriculars and, and stuff like that, like, and you be, you have homework and you become inundated by like the anxieties of adolescence and life and in right. middle school and high school, like it kind of faded a little bit, not to the point where I didn't enjoy it anymore, but just to the point where I like, just kind of forgot about it as an option for like my life. Um, but I still had this like weird, like, I guess, obsession, you could say with hotels, because, you know, even from when I was young, growing up, like I was always looking at like, okay, when I'm driving down the road, and I see, um, like, and I didn't know it at the time, but I'm driving down the road, and I see a Hilton Garden Inn in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's with without the right verbiage, like that's an upper mid scale property, but it's still select service. And I see a, a Motel 6 and I'm like, well, that's economy. Like I'm figuring out the, all the layers of the industry just driving down the street. Um, so I never really forgot about it. It just wasn't as prevalent until I started working in a hotel for real. And that's when life really changed. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, I was in high school and I was... Um, I was in high school and I was going to school in the morning, getting off and then uh, changing into a suit, going over to the hotel, working manager on duty shifts. I was a supervisor in high school at the front office. And, um, and I was like, you know, 16, 17 years old. And I'm like, I'm literally like running this hotel right now by myself. I was walking people when we were sold out. Like nobody told me what to do. I just figured it out and started walking people. Um, Oh, we have, a, you know, somebody crapped in the pool. Okay, I'm shutting the pool down. And I'm like 16 years old. And I'm just like, all right, let's just shut the pool down and figure it out. Like, so then when it was time to go to college, it was like, why do I need to do this? I'm already, and I thought I was the smartest person in the world. I thought that was all there was to running a hotel. And I was like, I'm already running a hotel by myself. Why do I need to go to college to do a non-hotel related degree program that I already committed to prior to like having this realization. Um, so then, and when I was in school, I was also working at a hotel and I just, it got to the point where I told my manager, I was like, I'm not really going to go to class anyway. So just put me on the schedule whenever <laughs> you want. Like I'd rather work. And then of course, when that happens, you don't, you don't do well and you leave. Uh, so that was how that happened. So, so then now you've kind of entered the hospitality career, right? And then the pandemic hits. And then at what point from the pandemic or did you start the hospitality MD? Because that is really going well for you. Yeah, things are going great with that. I actually started that back in 2018. So it's been even before the pandemic, right. I okay. started doing that. Um, but it's, that's been 
more of like a just a way to meet people, build influence, be relevant, um, have conversations. Like people will say, like, oh, um, like we don't make any money on the podcast, by the way. So people will say, like, oh, well, you're not making any money on it. So why, um, you know, why do you do it, or why is it important to you? Um, and like, for example, right now I'm sitting in a hotel that's across the country from where I was born and living and where my life was less than a year ago. And I'm here because of somebody who I invited to be a guest on the podcast. Wow. Um, so somebody might say, oh, well, you're, you didn't make any money on the podcast, but maybe I did because right now I'm living my dream. I'm living in the hotel for free. I have no expenses. I'm getting paid to be here. I get to learn every day. Um, so I don't know, was it worth it? Yeah, I think so. And I'm still having fun with it. Right. And, and, and the, the podcast is more than a podcast. It's kind of a media outlet, right? You're doing a lot right. of things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. You know, we do like short and like medium term video content on YouTube, um, like with pretty, some of our videos are pretty high quality production. Um, and then we've also gone as far as to produce, direct, and release a feature-length documentary film about the hotel that I'm in now, um, which was probably the most like fun project I've ever been a part of. Um, so we're, we're honored to, to have done that. And I'm honored to be the, you know, to be able to represent it and say that we did it, but it wasn't just me. It was, we had a, four people working on it together, which was, um, you know, an honor. And those people are lifelong friends now is this the hotel in Reading, pa that's right yeah. yeah yeah and when i saw one of your previous episodes you were doing a film festival how did that go oh we, we won we won oh, the festival great yeah so which is great um so people were like oh you're an award-winning filmmaker now and i'm like i don't know about that i'm just a hotelier who had a good story that I thought people might be inspired by that I wanted to share with people. Um, but I'm a one hit wonder. We'll see. Maybe there's another film coming out at some point. Who knows? But, um, but we're just, it, we didn't even need to win. The, the, the win for us was when we actually screened the film for the first time in front of the staff who work here in their ballroom. And the hotel, we, we worked together. This was before I was working here. We worked together to orchestrate a screening. So all the staff, their families, and then major clients of the hotel, community leaders, investors, stakeholders, all came and uh, they had, you know, banquet set up of like a movie, um, like a movie theater with a red carpet and like concession stand. So they made it kind of themed like a movie theater. And then people came in and watched the film. Um, and just the reaction from the people who work here from the community um, was what made it all worth it. That was, that was everything. Now I've seen the trailer, but how do you actually get to see the film? Yeah, so you can see the film by going to Real House, which is R E E L, like a film reel. So R E E L H O U S E dot org forward slash hospitality MD forward slash follow me. All one, that's the link to it. So realhouse.org forward slash hospitality MD forward slash follow me. Well, I'll take you right to the it. Uh, I will tell you that I've only seen the trailer, but my whole team has seen the trailer and we all loved it. Oh, good, good. Well, I'll look forward to hearing your feedback about it. And hopefully everyone enjoys it. That is cool. Okay, let's talk about a couple of things that you are, are important to you. And one of them is mentorship and hospitality. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about why that's important. It's important because how else do we have an industry if we're not mentoring people? Um, it's, it's absolutely critical. Uh, and it's, it's particularly important to me right now, now at this point in my, in my life, because I'm so honored to be the recipient of, 
of mentorship from the owner of this hotel, the subject of our award-winning documentary film and like my hero, Craig Poole, um, who is, and I, I was working at big hotels in downtown Chicago and, and I moved to a, a, a city that I didn't even know how to pronounce the name of. I thought it was Reading, but it turns out it's Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. um, so I went from a top 25 global market, working in high-end hotels, union properties, working with what people would consider to be the best of the best people in our industry, um, to going out to Reading, which is, the, you know, which at one point was actually the poorest city in the country, was one of the highest crime rates in the country, to work with uh, people here are second chance. So we have felon, former felons who work here with us, people who are battling addictions, um, people who've never done work like this before. So I leave the top 25 global market to come here. Why did I do that? Because of mentorship, because nobody in Chicago was, was mentoring me the way like Craig does here. Um, right. and it's changed everything for me. Um, it's, it makes me feel like there's a, I have a, a legacy to protect and a future to build for our industry as we move forward. And, and since then, I've, I've also had the privilege of mentoring people here. Currently, we have a summer intern um, who's 19 years old. She's never been away from home. Uh, she's not even getting any credit for this internship, by the way. She just went out of her way because she's a freshman going into sophomore year of college, which is too young, like to get credit for it in school. So she went out of her way to want to learn. So I'm like, well, we have an obligation to like really mentor her and not just say, here's some admin work that we don't have time to do that. You can just plug data into a spreadsheet for us. Cause that's what interns are supposed to do. Um, we're taking her, out. I was taking her out and we were, I was showing her, we closed $20,000 catering deals and we were going and, touring a winery we just did a, a wine tasting yesterday at somebody's private vineyard that they're turning into a wedding venue and I'm like you're not going to learn this in school um, but the point is it I'm taking this mentorship thing seriously here with people who work here and Craig is taking it seriously with me and I, I if people just took the time with other people um your business would make more money because people would be stronger and better at what they do. The industry would have a, a bright future, which it does, but you want good leaders moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, so I, I just think it's one of the single most important things we can do. If you, I know everyone says like, oh, I have so many emails I have to respond to, or, um, you know, what about the, uh, the shampoo that I have to order? Emails can wait, the shampoo order can wait. Uh, you know, 20 minutes or an hour is not going to, the world isn't going to collapse in that amount of time. The shampoo, you can still order it. The email will still be there when you're done taking the time with people. Um, but I actually recommend, and I'll actually give credit to this from, from Anthony Malcuri from Hotel Impossible mm -hmm. and No Vacancy. Uh, his suggestion was, because he and I had a similar conversation. He said, well, why don't people just come in at 7 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. and order the shampoo and do their emails and then they have more time to talk to people. I think that's, that's great. So you have to make a sacrifice though because at the end of the day, um, that's really what separates a leader from a task-driven person. Like you might be a manager in the organization who has emails and stuff to order. Um, but you're either a glorified admin by just only focusing on those things, or you're a leader if you come in early and take the time with people. Um, it's a really big responsibility. Um, so if you're not ready to be a mentor to people then, and to help other people grow, then maybe you're not ready to respond to emails or to order shampoo. Just that's a really thought. powerful. I mean, that's a yeah. big statement. I really appreciate that. I think mentorship is incredibly important. I've had some great mentors in my life. I hope I have done some mentorship in my life, um, but you're never too old for a mentor. Oh, totally, totally agree. As a matter of fact, like, you know, Craig Poole is 70 something years old and he's 50 years older than me. We have a 50 year age difference and we're friends. He's, but still business, you know, we're, he, we've had tough conversations too. He, he mentors me and even for at his age perfect so 
Craig and I have a 50 year age gap. He's 70 something, I'm 20 something. Um, but we have this relationship that works for us because he has, you know, almost 60 years in the business that as he's reaching the end of his legacy, quite frankly, he wants to impart this wisdom and knowledge onto somebody else. And I listen to him. So he, he tells me things. Um, and for me at, at 24 years old, um, you know, maybe I like the intern is 19. I'm 24. I'll impart my 24 year old wisdom onto the 19 year old because, it, and she listens, she wants to learn. Um, but you're never too old or too young to have a mentor. Craig even had his mentor who unfortunately passed away. His name was Albert Boskov. And Craig was in his late sixties or early seventies. And his mentor Al was 87. Wow. You're never too old. And here he is thinking, I want to impart my wisdom onto somebody. Yeah. Um, you're never too old or too young. It's, it's critical for everybody. Yeah. And I think you should be open to, you know, like you were saying, you have this 19 year old intern. Well, her go get it attitude is something that we can all learn from, right? Don't, don't take it for granted how young they are. There's something to be learned. Oh, absolutely. And good point. Like just me being able to teach somebody else helps me grow. And likewise for anybody else. Um, I think they even tell you that if you can teach it to somebody, that means that you know it. Um, so if I'm trying to teach her something and I realize that I can't teach it to her, then I need to go back to the drawing board and, and learn myself. And if I teach it and I'm being successful, then, oh, you know, I guess I know more about that than I thought I did. Yeah. And a good reminder for me. So it builds your confidence. It builds the confidence of the person that you're mentoring. Um, and everyone needs somebody yeah. who understands them. Um, and I think that's really what it is. It's, it's an element of belonging for people too. I have a mentor, somebody who I can count on to help. It's important. It's a, it is important. Okay, let's talk about, I have one other topic that I'd like to cover with you. And one of the things that you had said was um, the importance of not excluding yourself to your own department, like making, sh and I, I think at one point we were calling it cross training or, um, but you really find there's an importance of, you know, understanding all divisions and all departments. I do, um, but I think more importantly, it's like, don't allow yourself to believe that, um, that it's, there's one pathway or that you're on this trajectory or that trajectory. Like you, you probably understand what I mean. Like, oh, I'm on, I'm on the, the rooms, the rooms pathway because I was a front office manager. Right, right. I get it. Okay. Um, or, or, you know what? I, like I came up through sales or I came up through HR. Like I was actually thinking about doing an episode on hospitality MD where we find GMs who all come up through different things and have them debate about why they think their pathway was the best way to come up or, or, or they wish they would have come up through a different one. Um, but I came up in rooms, um, I started out in front office. I worked in housekeeping. I was a front office manager. Um, and nobody ever told me, uh, oh, and then I became the GM of the worst hotel in the brand, by the way. <laughs> um, and on the same day that I started at that hotel as the GM, we got a new catering sales manager who had never been in sales, never been in catering. Um, had no clue and I had never been a GM. I had never worked in, in sales. So how am I supposed to lead this person when I don't even know what their job is? Right. But I came up through room, so I'm fine. It really was an eye-opening thing for me. I'm like, this is, but nobody told me this was going to happen. Why did nobody, none of my mentors say, you know, you really should learn sales or, you know, it really might be good for you to dabble in food and beverage. Nope. Nobody told me, they said, you'll be a GM, just keep going through rooms. Um, and they don't encourage it because you're good at something, they keep you there. And nobody ever tells you until I met Craig. And he told me that in the 1970s and 80s, when he was coming up, somebody in rooms would never have been a GM. 
the trajectory was either director of food and beverage becomes GM or director of sales becomes GM. That was the way that hotel companies did it because in food and beverage, you really have to, you have to have finesse to make profit. In rooms, you could be awful and you could still have 60% profitability just because of the way that it, the business is. Right. Um, and in, for sales, no business has ever been successful without a sale. So if you don't know how to sell, how to yield revenue um, and, and how to build a business that's sustainable for years to come, like you have to do when you're a director of sales uh, and make long-term money over the course of your hotel's lifespan, you know, it, then why, why should you be a GM if you don't understand that concept? And I was like, wow, at some point something changed and you didn't need to learn those skills. Um, so what Craig did with me when I came here, he said, you're learning sales and you're learning food and beverage. I'm putting you in catering sales. So you learn both at the same right. time. Um, and since I've done this, I've been sharing and speaking out to my friends who I worked with who also came up with me through rooms or through one way who didn't know. And like, as of um, this past week, uh, Greg, who's my partner with Hospitality MD, he is interviewing to be a salesperson at a hotel, stepping down in theory, maybe we'll see, and hopefully his GM doesn't see this if it doesn't come to fruition. <laughs> but, uh, but he's leaving his director of rooms role to learn sales. He's trying to, he's interviewing for it because I've been sharing with him the importance and the lessons I've learned and how critical it is. He's doing that. Um, Tom, who was the uh, executive producer of the documentary, who also works in hotels, he's a classically trained filmmaker. He left his guest services manager role to be an entry level sales coordinator because he wanted to learn and he, he sees the importance of it. Um, and I think it's important for other people to know um, that there's not just these silos of sales is on their own. Because like, I actually remember, I'll tell just a quick story. When I first came here and I was, and I came into the sales office for the first time um, and I'm coming from operations and rooms. And I remember telling everybody, and I meant this no harm. I just thought it was funny. I was like, when I was in operations, and this is quote, when I was in operations, I used to call sales the 501 club because every time you'd go in at 501 into the sales office, if you needed something, the whole place was cleared out. <laughs> And people got pissed off and they told Craig about it and they were upset about it. And I, I had to hear about it. I really meant no harm by it, but that was the stigma that I had being in operations. And that stigma still exists. It wasn't just me. It was with everybody. And I'm sure you've seen it. You've mm -hmm. probably experienced it yourself. Um, but it wasn't until I came here that I had empathy for sales. I have, I understand what they're doing. It's not just whining and dying, dining and having weekends off and, you know, this, that, and the third, it's, we can't be successful without them. And it's a, understanding it is critical. Being able to do it is critical. Um, and if we want to be revenue generating hoteliers instead of cost cutting hoteliers, because you can only do two ways, you, there's only two options, then we need to focus on sales. Yeah. Um, and when you're coming up in corporate hotels, and maybe you're on a room's trajectory, they teach you how to cut labor, they teach you how to cut expenses, and yep, and then you'll re be ready to be a GM. So then you become a GM, you don't know anything about selling or generating revenue, but all you know how to do is what you were taught, which is how to cut costs. And now we're left with a generation of GMs who all they know how to do is cut costs and not generate revenue. Interesting. I want to be a revenue generating hotelier who has a successful business with lots of revenue, lots of help, lots of people, um, a different amenities. Like I don't want to, cutting costs is never fun in this business. So you can do it two ways. I choose to be the revenue generator and I want to learn it. So that's why I took a, a, a massive step back to learn this and humble myself and grow about it because it will only make me more successful in the long run. Um, and it's the right thing to do for the people who you work with because there's people with kids, there's people who have families, they just wanna work. And then 
over generations of time, you've been told to cut people's hours instead of generate more revenue for them so they can work. Right. Um, so it's only the hospitable thing to do to generate more revenue. That is great. Thank you so much for being a guest. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I hope right. people learned something. Hold on, okay? Mm-hmm.